Oh, there he is. Guide him. Yes, you can see where he was. This bill um, actually was thought of and written before I became a legislator. Um, and it, it's a matter of constitutional rights and fairness. Uh, this comes through personal experience from some family members and also some people who I've represented and also from people who have come to me <laughs> for representation that I have not represented. For the most part, what I've determined is, uh, as we all know, the majority of our police departments in this state do an excellent job. But notwithstanding that, there are police, police men and women and some police departments who abuse the law and the rights of individuals. This bill is one of fairness, and when I explain it, I believe the only objection anybody could have to it is the time period of five days. What happens if somebody gets a restraining order, and we've seen good restraining orders, and I've seen many abuses of restraining orders, is that the police can immediately come and remove the weapons and any evidence they want and take it, and that's the way it should be. And in criminal cases, that's the way it should be. But what I'm finding in a minority of police departments, uh, and, and, uh, and this happens more to lower income, people who don't have a good voice, less educated, is that, especially with weapons, when the person is deemed not guilty or the restraining order is lifted, there are some, a, a great minority, but there are some police departments or policemen or women who will do everything in their power to delay the return of those things. And so I brought this bill up. My, my, my thought process is if the police can get there in a matter of minutes to confiscate weapons or property when there's an allegation, then certainly once they're notified, and they are notified when somebody is innocent or there's a restraining order lifted, then certainly within five days, the burden should be upon them to return it. What I've seen is uh, a restraining order that is deemed that is dropped and deemed not you know not to not there's no finding and somebody then has to petition to get their property back. Well, they didn't peti they did nothing wrong and they're innocent. They didn't petition to have somebody come into their house and remove their property. So once there's a the, the system has the legal right to come in and get somebody's property if there's an allegation. But once that person is deemed innocent, then the system should have an obligation to return that property. The obligation should not be on the individual to go to the police department and ask and be delayed or say, no, we need a court hearing, even though in most cases a court hearing isn't required, and therefore it's another 15 or 30 days before they get the property back. Um, there's a broader application to this bill, but I didn't want to confuse the issue this year. I, I may, if it passes, uh, amend it next year. Uh, but let me give you an example of an abuse that deals uh, indirectly with this bill. Um, but just an abuse that happened in a small town near me um, that I advised the person on but did not represent them. An individual was denied a uh, carry, permit to carry, based on a fight that this individual got into 10 years prior uh, by a police department. So the individual was pretty adamant about his second amendment rights, so he started to carry openly. Uh, the police did not like that. Um, and when he, um, he appealed the decision not to be able to carry, in the hearing at the court, the police officer who was there to testify actually said, he will get a permit over my dead body. Now this is an individual who was able to carry a gun and who um, was carrying openly, legally. What happened after, uh, and this is just to show what abuses can occur, and this person is not an indigent individual, but a, a very low income individual and cannot afford representation, so I didn't represent him, but I advised from the side. What happened after, because the police were very upset that he was carrying openly, is one day he came home with his girlfriend, 
who had obtained a license to carry and had the gun in her computer case in the back seat. They pulled into the driveway and there were seven police cars there. They separated them. They asked the girl, do you have a license, do you have a license to carry? And she said, of course I do. You gave it to me. And he said, do you have the gun in the car now? She says, yes, I do. Where is it? It's in my computer case behind my seat. Can I see it? Sure. They open up the computer case and there's a gun. The gentleman was being detained over here. As soon as they saw the gun, they arrested him for carrying concealed, a concealed weapon because that weapon was within his reach in the car. Did he get off? Yes. But this is the abuse, this is the abuse that some police departments and some policemen will go, will do or to prove their point. So he eventually, now what the, what the intent was there was to make it so he got convicted so he couldn't carry openly also. He didn't get convicted, but what it did is it took his guns out of his possession and other paraphernalia or whatever out of his possession for a period of time. That's just an example of some of the abuses that I have seen in my law office and through advising people. This <coughs> happened, uh, there are other instances where they have, that have been directly relevant to this. And so I said, look, if, if the agency can come in and take these items, then they have an obligation to return them and the duty should be on, on, upon them. Originally I put in that this is just a violation of constitutional rights, but then I realized that if that's all I did, then the burden would still be on that person to prove a violation of the constitutional rights. So then I, I, after talking with uh, different representatives of some police, uh, then I said, well, if we put in a fine of $100 per day, this will show the police departments or the entities that we're mean this and they will adhere to it. I don't expect that any police department or any agency is going to get fined $100 per day because they're going to comply with the law. Because if not, they're going to have to explain why they didn't and a payment's going to be required. So this is, this is a bill of fairness. It's a bill of constitutional rights. And the only logical objection uh, I can see to this bill is a police department saying five days isn't enough because of this. And in that case, that's fine. If a police department came in and said five days isn't enough because of this, and they had a logical argument, then let's change the bill to six or seven days. But we need a definite time period where the, op where the, where the department has an obligation <coughs> to return the property. And I'd, I'd be glad to answer any questions. How many of these cases that you know of have taken place where the PDs did not return uh, the weapons that had been confiscated while the adjudication of the trial and the person was found innocent and the, and, and the stuff was not returned? I don't think it's a matter of not returning them. I know of, I know of one case that I haven't investigated where the property supposedly hasn't been returned. It's a matter of delaying the return. I know of somebody who was months before they got their, their property back. And this is, a, it, this is a matter of the Constitution. It, and the fact is, if the, police, if the police can get in there and they have a right to and should confiscate this material with no problem, then certainly once the person's found innocent, then the burden should be on the police to return. But as far as how many of these cases, I have heard throughout my years many cases that in fact it happened to a family member. Uh, and I can give you that example if you'd like. Follow up? Thank you. Uh, would you be amenable, you, you were talking about five days and that could be bigger days. Would you be amenable to say something like 10 working days, 10 working days to return within 10 working days? I think. Whatever the committee <coughs> finds reasonable, I, I know there's at least one police officer who will testify today. Uh, and the only, like I said, the only reasonable reason I see for objecting to this is the time period. If the police can show that five days just isn't enough, 
but 10 is. I think 10 is a little long because I know that if the police have to confiscate it, they get there within hours. So I do want to hold them to a limit, but not an unreasonable limit. Okay. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Gary, I was just curious about in the, in the criminal book, it tells that the person that lost their stuff, there's some kind of process about petitioning the court to get it back. So if they're having a problem, uh, would they have to petition the court first? No, I think I think you're talking about if you're talking about the prior part of this uh, <coughs> statute. I think you're talking about people whose property has been taken as evidence in an ongoing trial, and if they need that property back, they can petition the court and say, um, Your Honor, we really need this property back. Like in Keene, there was uh, somebody with uh, we read in the headlines about the surveillance equipment that was taken, and we wanted the property back. They can petition the court, and in that case, the court can say, okay, yes or no, and if the court says give the property back, the court will allow them to take pictures, the police take pictures of the property and use it as, as evidence. Follow up? So at the moment, uh, there is no, that you know of, no process for just, like, domestics or things that you can get back. They don't petition the court? They're, they're, the process puts the burden on the innocent party. I'm making a distinction between a guilty party and an innocent party because in family court, for instance, many times, many times, um, restraining orders are thrown in there to try to get an advantage in a case. And many, many times the restraining orders, well, just about all the times, the restraining orders, they come and take people's property. When the judge, for instance, makes a uh, finds that there hasn't been, that there was no reason for the restraining order. At that point, the judge has deemed that that person is innocent with regard to the, the allegations. And at that point, the obligation becomes the government's, not that individual, to get the people, to get the property back. You know, somebody, somebody takes your property because you're accused of something wrongly. <coughs> the court finds you innocent. Why should you have to go through these administrative steps to get your property back? The burden should be on the agency that took it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Question for you is a little bit oblique to your specific bill, but in your uh, experience or with people you've spoken with on this issue, do you know if sometimes the law enforcement agencies charge storage fees for some of the things that they've taken before people can get them returned? I don't. And I also want to say that this isn't a police bashing bill. I think that. Uh, you know, our town, for instance, which is Chichester, has an excellent department, and, and most towns, I think, do. But as in any occupation and any anything, you have certain towns or certain departments and certain individuals within certain departments who have the wrong, in my idea, have the wrong attitude. Um, and, and that's a minority of police departments. So I respect the work that our officers do, and I crafted <coughs> this very carefully so as not to penalize them. And that's why I said, with, it, with reference to the five or ten days, uh, you know, that's important. But this is to a minority of abuses. Some abuses from police departments I've seen personally um, that don't apply to this bill. But I think it's a fair bill. And But no, in return to your question, I, the storage hasn't come up. Do any other questions? a two-part question. Where did you come up with the $100 figure? and the five-day limit? The, the five-day limit was just through talking with, uh, as best I could, with some law enforcement people that I know. But like I said, if there was anything that could be complained about, it, it, if a police officer comes up here and says, you know, we have all, after, after we get the finding, we have this and that and the other to take care of. Um, I originally had three days and extended it to five days with the recognition on the other side that sometimes people just want to delay for their own expediency, but with a recognition that when, they're, when they come and get these things, they can do it within a matter of hours. So this is of some importance. It's not of critical importance, but it's of some importance that somebody's constitutional rights are now, you could say, being violated because they're innocent and somebody has confiscated their property. As far as the $100, uh, that also uh, is an issue where I didn't want to, and, and it's a little arbitrary, I didn't want it to be too small where they would ignore it, which now there, nothing happens, so some police departments ignore it. I didn't want it to be too large so it would be massive, 
But I also want the recognition that these are constitutional rights. This is an important right. So the $100 is whatever is also one of those variables that I had to make a determination on. I thought it was enough where it would get the police department's attention and they wouldn't violate. This isn't to catch the police department. It's just to let them know. I, I don't think any police department is going to have a fine. I, I, I think that they're going to recognize that this needs to be done and we'll get it done. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, as I mentioned or noted on my card, the purpose of my testimony today here is just to uh, provide information uh, to the committee on the bill. Um, my name is Karen Eppel. I'm an Assistant Attorney General. I work in the, uh, the Department of Justice in the Criminal Bureau. Um, the, um, clearly, the, there is a distinction with this bill uh, made between uh, persons that are uh, after trial found, uh, in, found not guilty versus uh, guilty. However, just as um, when you read the law as it's with the amendment, it does create um, a, a little bit of a ambiguity, or um, uh, it, it, it does conflict a little bit, the two sections. Because um, under section one, a court order is required um, before, uh, before the police may uh, release seized property uh, to its rightful owner. Uh, that's before or after trial. Um, and section two will uh, make a distinction and say that if you're found uh, not guilty, or your case is dismissed, um, your property will be returned um, without a court order. Um, now that, I mean, that could cause some issues. Um, it doesn't, section two does not re uh, specifically refer to contraband, like section one will specifically exclude the return of contraband or contraband per se. So <clears throat> is section two saying that um, the police would have to return all property, including that. Um, that would certainly need some clarification. Um, the five-day period probably is unrealistic because uh, in most cases the police don't know on the day that a case is either dismissed or uh, a defendant is found not guilty. Uh, the, defendant, uh, or the police department might not know about that resolution on that day. Someone would have to tell them. Uh, and there's nothing in the bill that would indicate the notice. Uh, who's providing notice? How are they finding out? And then uh, I think once they have notice, it would certainly five days would not be um, Also, a clarification on um, dismissal. Does that, is that referring to a court dismissal? <coughs> or does that also include when a prosecutor uh, will null pros? Uh, they call it no process uh, case when they elect not to prosecute the case. That is a prosecutorial decision. Um, does it encompass those situations as well? Um, and also, uh, because criminal proceedings are dismissed for a variety of reasons, um, perhaps removing the term innocent from the, uh, from the section two. Um, you know, persons who have had who have had property seized from them under Section One that are awaiting trial are also innocent persons. So perhaps either removing innocent or say a person under this section might be um, a, a better way of um, a better term. And also the uh, the office would be happy to work with it, the committee in drafting any language. Uh, we weren't sure what. Uh, the intent was, but given the testimonies I heard from the tweet, it's clear that there's a distinction being made here. So uh, those are the points that I wanted to make for the committee. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you have any? The question that I have is, I guess, the, the difficult <laughs> writing and listening at the same time, I just don't have that talent. The question that I've got very simply is, is why does it take if a person is found in a super? When a person is found innocent, why does it take a court order to return that item? 
Did I misunderstand? Under what current law, that is how we read it. Under under the way the law is written today, in the books right now, um, we the way we we ask for the court to for that disposition. In the decision of innocent, would the judge then say, and all your possessions are returned? Would that be what you're talking about as the court's order? Well, yes. Well, typically a motion is filed uh, even after after acquittal. Uh, even, even guilty persons are allowed to have their personal property returned to them after trial. There are some things that are seized that are no longer needed. Um, so typically it is an issue that is uh, brought forward to the court. We want to return certain items. We want to retain or destroy other items. And that is the, the, the way that evidence, the disposition of evidence is handled currently under the way the law is currently written in all cases. After trial or before trial, it's always through a court order. The 